I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We are a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit. It's focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week, here on Conservation Connection, we do just that. Introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management, and we ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is a collaboration with EarthX here in Dallas, Texas. EarthX is the largest Earth Day celebration in the world, and it brings in speakers from every corner of the environmental arena. Listen in to hear the stories of today's environmental titans, covering everything from environmental law, ocean health, renewable energy, clean transportation, and so much more. Let's get to the show. All righty, guys. Welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We are here at EarthX 2022 in their fantastic podcasting studio. We are so excited for this episode to be sitting down with Lawrence Carr, who is the CEO and founder of Lawrence Carr, Inc., a regenerative design firm. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. We're so happy to have you here at EarthX. So why don't you give us just a background of what is your company? What do you do? Yeah, so Laurence Carr Inc. is a regenerative design firm. And by that, we mean that we focus on wellness, sustainability, and circularity practices for the build environment, architecture, and design and furnishing industry. We deliver interior design services primarily for residential and commercial spaces, but uh, I also um, recently started to design products, products that are cradle to cradle and really oriented into regenerative materials and uh, biofabricated materials. And that's a really important space to be in because a lot of, I mean, most products that you pick up on a day-to-day basis don't have an end of life plan. Once it's exceeded its useful life, what am I going to do with the plastic tube that is in this pen that I'm holding, right? Once it's no longer functioning as a pen, where does it go? What does it do? And that's kind of what you're looking at, right? Is from beginning to end, how is this circular, right? How does it come back to being useful again once it's been finished? That's right. That's absolutely right. That's a very important point. What we do is that, you know, as designers, um, so my team of designers and myself, when we have projects, we really want to make sure that we will ask manufacturers, brands, builders, you know, specifiers with who we work, what is the life cycle of the products and materials that they use. So we want to know where do they come from, what are they made of, you know, what exactly is the use that we're going to have with it, and then what's the end use life of that product, how can we reuse it, and make sure that it doesn't end up in the landfill. Um, so having that approach is very important because it just really specifies, you know, how we're going to make at the very beginning, when we are just at the conceptual phase, you know, we, we choose with who and with what we're going to work. Right. And that brings up another really good point because it's not just the end of life for your product, right? It's where does it come from before it's useful? What is the raw material? And is that raw material being collected in a sustainable way, a way that means that people in 10, 20, 30 generations from now would be able to collect it in the same manner because it's regenerative? Right. Absolutely. So we really, you know, all know that the planet has finite resources and we just want to make sure that whatever we take from it, we're going to be very uh, thoughtful and conscious about how we extract it or how we select it, just to make sure that, you know, we can source and specify and choose products that are um, thoughtfully selected. So I feel like sustainable and regenerative design is a fairly specific business to be in. So how long have you been doing this? And how did you get started? Like what made you want to do this? Yeah, so I mean, this is actually my third career. Um, I lived in four continents. 
I was born in France and raised in Europe and, you know, then lived in Australia, Asia, the US and had different careers. But I came into the creative uh, work of inter-architecture and design because I, I just love creating spaces and flow into interiors and environments. Um, now, when I started that 15 years ago, I didn't hear many words about wellness nor sustainability. And as a European who grew up and we are quite attuned with, you know, the world green, ecology and even circular economy. So I was just a bit surprised and actually quite frustrated. So after working with an interior design firm for residential and commercial spaces, I decided to launch my own firm and really focus on to circularity, really bringing conversation with clients as well as brands and manufacturers about healthy materials, about wellness in interiors and really discuss what specifically it means. And what it means is that, first of all, the build environment contributes, you know, up to 40% globally in terms of carbon emission and waste. So we really need to understand that there is a wake up call here and we need to address it as much as we can. All of us, architecture, builders, designers, brands, manufacturers, you know, and organizations that work with the building environment. And secondly, I think it's very important as designers and specifiers to really understand more accurately what healthy materials mean. Really get educated, not hesitate to just really keep getting educated about what they are. So I really wanted to bring that and I became an advocate in the industry and started to speak about it profusely, actually put panels together and produce and become a platform partner with a Circular City Week, which is a festival in New York, all about circularity across all industries. And, and we started this uh, in 2018 when they just started uh, launching this festival and, and I started producing webinars and panels, you know, and then the pandemic happened and we were even more online and, and so the conversation just started expanding and I could see that there was a real, real, you know, movement and a real interest. And, and now, I guess, you know, in 2022, there's a real conversation. Earth Day is tomorrow, and I see, you know, uh, organizations and publications and designers and architects all talking about sustainability. Yeah, and that's one of the really cool things we've gotten to sort of watch over our careers is the expansion of the environmental movement outside of people who work in, like, forestry or biology, right? It's more than just that. It's people in design. It's people who are in finance. It's people who are good at something and that's the job, but they want to do it in a sustainable way that helps the planet instead of extracting resources from it and not giving back. So this is for me is a very exciting episode because as much as I love talking to scientists, really I do, it's super fun to talk with people who their expertise is in, you know, interior design or commercial design, because you can have, you said it yourself, 40% of, what was that number? Give me that again. It's 40%, you know, uh, the, the built environment contributes, which is housing, you know, construction, right. waste. It contributes globally, you know, to 40% of waste and pollution and carbon emissions. So Right. Those are things we're trying to tackle. And there's nothing that I could do on a daily basis that would have the same scale of impact. No change I can make in my life that has the same scale of impact as adjusting the thinking of the industry in order to reduce their global footprint, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm an ambassador for the Sustainable Furnishing Council, which is a nonprofit coalition that really collaborates with manufacturers, architects, designers, and really talk about sustainability in the furnishing industry. So now when we become aware, um, there was a recent report by the EPA that in 2017, Americans, you know, waste more than 12.2 million tons of furniture and it ends up in the landfill. Now that's a frightening number and that number has not necessarily decreased since then, you know. So we do and we have to, we designers, architects have to do something about this. So 
to me, it was very important to start talking about it even more extensively. And so today I'm in FX here in Dallas, Texas, as we have been collaborating on a TV series with FX TV uh, called The Chez Laurence. It's an original series and we talk extensively. So I'm the creator and host of this TV series and executive producer. And in this series, we talk extensively with the CEOs of brands and manufacturers, as well as organization about sustainability. How can we incorporate more circular practices into their business, into their companies, into their organizations. So the conversation really happens here. And for the audience, I think it's going to be really important as we address more eco-conscious consumers. Speaking of that, how do we address that? Because so much of everything now really is we want everything fast. You know, it's fast fashion, fast design, fast, you know, I order on, on Amazon and hopefully it's here the next day. Like I want everything right now. So how do you address that with the businesses you're working with, but also the consumers? Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. I think, uh, you know, really the Gen Z and the millennials are really, you know, going away from the fast furniture purchase. They are really more eco-conscious consumers. They really look more uh, into how the products that they buy, whether it's food, fashion, and they're very savvy with fashion, you know, and how to, to buy for themselves online or uh, in person and furniture. They really want to make sure that the brand has a uh, commitment, has a commitment of transparency, has some recognized certification, you know, some standard and even a, a pledge of transparency on their website. So I think that's that phenomenon. We are really entering into an era of eco-conscious consumers. But also the important thing is as designers and architects, we really want to make sure that we specify brands that have certification and some standards. So there's a few, you know, like the Forest Stewardship Council. We want to make sure that when we buy furniture with wood, it is validated and recognized by this organization who will only, you know, recognize your uh, brand if you have been careful about how you source you, you would. I think that speaks a lot to there's a need for companies that are profitable, but are also investing time and energy into more than just growing profits, right? About growing profits for the long term, not this quarter, but for the next 15 years. How do we make sure that we are able to keep sourcing our products? How are we able to keep our community engaged in a way that values the long term over the short term gains. Right, that's right. And I think that's what the circular economy system talks about. You know, it's not only just a system about, you know, avoiding uh, waste, reducing water consumption. It's just much more than that. There's also regenerative food, regenerative agriculture. How can we create products that can upcycle multiple times, you know, before it's not possible and, and possibly with some products endlessly, but it's also a business model. You know, businesses that really invest into the sustainability commitment and pledge and show it to the consumer and get this emotional, you know, response have really more success to actually uh, earn money and, and develop as a successful business. And have reliable consumers, right? Because yes. that's obviously not everybody is of the same mindset. But I do think that we see more and more that the consumers are looking for products that are sustainable, that even though it might be a slightly more expensive product. It's worth it to the consumer to go for the brand that has demonstrated social promises and commitments over the ones that are a little bit cheaper. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in 2021, BlackRock, which is, you know, the largest asset management company, its a CEO, Larry Fink, uh, was just making uh, an announcement and really explained how it was important for companies to really understand that the commitment to transparency, sustainability is vital, vital for their return of, of investment. Um, and that consumers who do not you know, look away from sustainability, it's actually quite the opposite. 
Um, and very suddenly has been a turning point with the pandemic when people have been stuck home and just looked around and saw their interiors and thought, well, this is not good. I really need to live in a better environment. I need to think about my indoor air quality. You know, that's been a, a great and a very important uh, progress the last two years. Also, my furniture, what is this? You know, how messy is this? Or should I maybe declutter? Don't I have a bit too much, you know? And what is my relationship to nature? People realize the importance of actually being connected to the outdoors while being at home, um, spending so much time, you know, working from home. Now, this work from home phenomenon is not going away as things have shifted globally and this work from home is a phenomenon that is staying. So I guess for the housing industry, it's even more interesting because we are really addressing our clients who are aware about their wellness and this, the importance of sustainability. And the two of them are actually inextricably linked. You know, if we don't tend to one, uh, well, we don't tend to the other one. That is a very interesting point that quarantine being locked in, in your space for days and days and days would absolutely make interior design and their personal home environment a much higher priority to take control of it and make sure that it is helping you rest and regenerate yourself so that you can continue to be productive in whatever you're doing, whether that's staring at a computer for eight hours a day or whatever that work is that you're doing in that space now. Uh, I had not considered that quarantine would have quite that effect. I mean, from a, a design perspective and an interior product perspective, that is a very interesting point. It is a very uh, important uh, phenomenon. Uh, the health and wellness angle has really increased, you know, from the brand point of view, as well as the architect and designers and clients. Um, so everybody now considers what are healthy materials? How can I get these low VOCs paint? Or what does this furniture emit? Is this an antique? If it's an antique, it's fine. It gave like more than 30 years, you know, time for the VOCs to, you know, emit out there. But everybody is more conscious about the quality of a material and the product that they buy for the interiors. Yeah, absolutely. I think another interesting part that comes along with that is as people are sitting inside looking at all of their stuff and maybe being like, oh, I need new stuff. I need a new couch or a new this or a new that. They're also thinking like, well, if I'm going to be using it like every day for the next who knows how long, like all the time, most of the day, I want it to not fall apart in a month. So they're more willing to invest in the quality of something that they think is going to hold together. And I think a lot of the times businesses that are willing to put effort into sustainability and the materials that they're using are also going to put more effort into the quality of their design, making sure that it lasts, like you said. Right, right. And so um, we see an interest, you know, to really focus more on sustainability and creating less waste. The secondhand uh, market is really picking up. You know, we see businesses like First Dibs, Cherish, which sell antiques, you know, whether they're 20 years old or much older. And we see that interest from consumers saying, you know what, let's not buy necessarily new and, you know, not, we don't know where it comes from, but let's try and see what's in the past. And there's really a lot of value and is of good quality, good craftsmanship. Um, there is also a, a new market of furniture company that start uh, renting um, so it's quite, you know, IKEA has been doing it in Europe and globally now, but you have a, a lot of uh, shops and brands that have started this in Europe, but you also see it on the West Coast and East Coast in the US. And, and that way, you know, you can just rent your furniture, leave there for a couple of years, return it, you know, or even a year after return it, change, you know, whether you move or don't move and just want a change of scenery. But that really helps and avoid, you know, putting more furniture in the landfill. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to take just a little step back here. We've talked a lot about your work and the importance of your work, but I'd like to get to know a little bit more about you and what was your journey to get to where you are today. I know that you mentioned that you've had three careers. You've lived in four continents. You currently live in New York City, uh, but you were born in France, you said? Yes, I'm French, yes. So did you always know that working in the green sector, sustainability, stuff like that was going to be something you were interested in? Or did that just kind of, you saw a problem and said, well, if nobody else is going to fix it, I'm going to give it a shot. That's 
a great question. I think I was always, and I actually think there is a real relationship with a sustainability, health, and a holistic approach and respecting and loving the planet. And I say that because from a very young age, um, I was in the performing arts, but I was always very interested in uh, looking after myself, making sure that I was very healthy from a very, very young age as a child. And so I started practicing yoga, meditation. I don't even know why I started that, but you know, maybe in the previous life, it was very important. And that always helped me, you know, not only perform and be extremely successful in what I was doing, but also I was always very aligned and very in touch with nature. So then I did other, you know, I had another career more into the marketing, communication, large events, you know, in Australia and Asia. But I still wanted to do something creative. So I went back and that's what brought me to interior architecture, architecture and design. And, and seeing that in that industry, there was not enough talk about nature and the planet and how can we make sure that we are respecting it and we are not always, you know, taking infinitely more resources and over decorating, over designing. I think that's where, you know, the link came from being healthy, making sure that we are always aligned, you know, as human beings and with nature and just making sure that what I do as a designer is aligned with, you know, respecting the planet as well as respecting myself because being healthy is very important and it's part of respecting myself. So if any of our listeners wanted to get into the same or similar field as you or just to kind of try to live more sustainably, buy more sustainably, what would you recommend that they do? I would say don't get overwhelmed. Uh, Start with just one thing, just one step at a time and just try to see how, you know, you, you consume food and what do you do with the waste? You know, can you compost? You know, it starts with food. I think there's a real relationship with your lifestyle, as I was just saying before, you know, how you you, you interact with food, clothes, and your interiors, you know, and the consumption of it and how you, you do it and how you will really have a sustainable lifestyle. So start with that. But also educating yourself is very important. So the demand of sustainability starts with the demand of consumers. The more consumers will be educated the more manufacturing brands and companies and organizations will have to respond to it. It works together. So there are certifications that you can read online. You know, you can go to the sustainable furnishings dot org and then find out that there are a lot of brands that are sustainable and what are the certifications you know the forest stewardship council what is cradle to cradle what is uh guts you know which is a textile certification so you can always educate yourself it's free just go to a few uh cradle to cradle you know another organization go to the ellen MacArthur foundation we just had the ceo who's talked about circular economy so interesting you have regular reports the circularity gap i mean i can go on and on and on it's just there it's available if you're interested you read one thing and another and you understand the importance of protecting our planet but also yourself absolutely and you dear listener right now are educating yourself just by listening to this podcast and being interested in these issues so good on you if you would like to learn a little bit more about some of those organizations she was talking about scroll down to the show notes i'm going to drop some links in there so you guys can go ahead and and go straight from this podcast to learn more about sustainable furnishing and circularity in the design world Absolutely. And before we sign off, let us know um, who can we expect to see on season two of your EarthX TV show? What can we expect to hear about? Uh, Just a little blurb. Okay, so um, really season two is going to be more from the consumer point of view, uh, really understanding what circularity is and how important it is in the interior design industry, in the build environment, but also design related industries. So we're going to explore what happens in hospitality, um, in the development, construction, and and a few other things. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. We're so excited to be here with you. And I cannot wait to share this story with the world. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. 
We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet, and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.